Welcome to the fifth uh, webinar that we're having in this series uh, for the 4-H LEGO Robotics Challenge. Uh, this year's theme is uh, 2020 Agricultural Innovations in Rural and Urban Communities. My name is Phil Malone and I am the uh, one of the coaches for the GeForce um, FTC team who are the creators of the challenge each year. So that's why we're organizing these webinars and they're being presented by students from the team. Uh, tonight's topic is uh, project presentation. And we've done several topics in the past. We've had uh, going through the game manual. We've had uh, the, this, uh, how to choose and, and, and organize a service project, uh, what different Lego hardware choices you can have, uh, and how to put together a team notebook. So tonight we're going to be talking about the project presentation, um, which is something that's given to a group of people at the competition. They could be judges, they could be just audience participation. And uh, it's, it's judged and the team is awarded a score based on their presentation. So to go through the presentation, we have Sarah and Amelia who will introduce themselves. Uh, and I'm going to enable their mics and turn mine off. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Amelia. I, I'm on GeForce, a 4-H robotics group. Um, and I've been involved with robotics for about nine years now. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm on GeForce and I've been doing robotics for about six years. So tonight we're going to be talking about the project presentations. So let's discuss what project presentations are. This is a three to five minute presentation in which the team shows and explains their service project. And then afterwards the judges have about five minutes to ask the team questions regarding their project. So there are three different types of projects, the service project, research project, and innovation project. The service project primarily deals with satisfying a specific need. The research project is studying a specific problem within your community and the innovation is creating a solution for a problem that you found in your community. So service-based projects is where a team provides a service or services for their community to solve a problem that they found. So in these presentations, you're going to want to include how you found the problem in your community and what that is. So you could, for example, a team previously has provided lunch for veterans. So your problem could be um, just like poor veterans who need something, you know? Um, and then you can explain what the services were and how this combated the issue in your community. Then you can tell the judges how your community or that specific group benefited from the services you provided. It's also very important to discuss with the judges about the people that you met and what they had to say about what you were doing. During a research-based project, you should first explain how you came up with the, with the topic that you are researching. And then you want to explain where you found your research, for example, within books, websites, and talking to specific experts. After you do that, you want to explain what your team found do while doing their research and who your team shared the research with, as well as how it could affect the people you shared it with. This is different than the service or the innovation um, projects. Because you are researching solutions or problems, you're not coming up with something uh, and you're just presenting the information that you found rather than what you've created. With invention and innovation based product projects, teams invent or innovate a solution to solve a problem. Um, what to include in this kind of presentation would be the, um, how you found the problem in your community um, and tell the judges about the problem. For example, um, a team member may have just started an aquaponics farm and found that the filter that they were using wasn't properly circulating the water. Then you want to explain how your team conducted your research. Did you use books? Did you use websites? Did you use um, experts, which is what we want to recommend kids to do. Meet with as many experts in the field that you're studying as possible. Then now it's time to introduce your innovation or invention and what it does. If you have a model, you want to show it and describe how it works. 
and what people, especially experts, think about it. Um, if you don't have a working model, that's okay, but you need to show what it would look like and how it would work. If it is an innovation, you want to explain why your solution is better than the ones that are already on the market for this problem. Then you want to tell who you shared your solution with and how it will benefit them. So in terms of the example that I gave with the aquaponics farm, you could invent a new or you could innovate a new type of filter and present it to a local Lions Club and those people in the Lions Club could use that to make their own aquaponics farms or improve their own aquaponics farms. Sorry. For your closing of your presentation, it should mostly be a summary of what you've already presented to the judges and why it's important for people to understand. And it's really helps when you have an important closing line that they can remember. For example, find your way with direct away was a slogan that we've come up with. Um, general things to include in your presentation. In the rubric, it states that you should have good visuals um, that are easily understood. And we also suggest having judges handouts that explain what your service project is and how you did it. Just have like a brief summary about all of that and also an annotated bibliography, which is just like a list of sources that you used um, for your research and just like the production of your um, project. Consider having a theme to your presentation, like one year on my FLL team, we had a Star Trek theme another year. We, um, we had, we all dressed up as bees. This kind of thing um, makes you really stand out to the judges and it makes you more memorable. Like I mentioned earlier, um, the judges will have five minutes of questioning afterwards but sometimes judges don't have the full, don't have enough questions to fill those five minutes. So it's a good idea to have topics ready to discuss, like how you did your research, how you came up with your project, who you met, just like experiences and stories that you had while you were working on this project. It's also very important to remember to be nice to your teammates. Don't blame someone for forgetting a line and just overall have a good attitude about being there. Um, this is just for fun. It's there's no reason to take it too seriously. You're there to have a good time. So general things to improve within your presentation can be introducing yourself, having a fun intro, making sure they remember your team. We also suggest writing a script when you're presenting to judges so that you know what you're performing and you're prepared with what you're going to say and make sure that you well practice your script so everyone remembers it and proofread it once you're finished writing it so that we so that you can tell that it's very cohesive and easy to understand when presenting it ask people who you are presenting it to like adults and your coaches after you present it if they have any questions so be prepared to answer questions and just wear something almost or have something fun that makes you very memorable like for example wearing fun hats okay um i think that's everything if you all have any questions please direct those to mr phil or miss arlene thank you very much Thank you, Amelia and Sarah. Um, all right, nothing coming in just yet. So one thing I did want to bring up is you talked about a rubric and you talked about things you want to include. Well, a useful thing to consider is uh, there's a score sheet for the judges to score the presentation. So I just figured I'd bring it up. Each of the, the sections of the challenger are worth 100 points. So the service, uh, the service project presentation sheet is worth 100 points. And, you know, it's a, it's a combination of um, how well the presentation was done, which is this first section. And the second section is the, the quality of the content within the presentation. So many of the topics the girls talked about are in here. You know, introducing the team. Um, the last thing you want to do is go in there and just start talking without letting the judges know who you are and what team you're from. And a little bit of background is helpful. Um, present information in a logical order makes sense because it lets, it lets you control the flow of how you want to you know, provide the information. And good visuals. Um, the next presentation we have next week is about the, the project display. And so there's different ways you can 
present information. A trifold is one way, but there's lots of other ways. So we'll cover that. And make sure you summarize your presentation at the end. So that's generally, you know, good quality presentation. And then, you know, providing as much details about the sort of things you did to, as part of the actual research and how you worked with the community and uh, some of the benefits. That's the second part of the content. So, you know, after you've come up with an idea, a clever idea, and you know, put your notes down, go back to the score sheet and see, you know, have you missed anything? And do you need to boost some sections and provide more details? Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that, Phil. I know that's always a guide we go back to as our rubrics and score sheets to just to make sure we haven't forgotten something. So, um, girls, uh, what's some examples of some creative visuals that you all as a team have, have used to, to share information with the judges and to put a little pizzazz into it besides your display board? And I know you've done some creative things with your display board too. So can you share just a couple things that you've done with... Um, when I was on FLO, we created the Bee Haven, which was like a greenhouse and kept bees warm. That doesn't matter. But we created a logo for the product, um, which I think really helped with um, judges being able to remember it. So it was a little cute bee, um, and it just it's pretty well summarized what we wanted the product to be. Excellent. And you actually took the, a full-size model of the Bee Haven into the judging contest, didn't you? Yeah. rather than the display board that year, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a neat product like that that you went out and done something in the community with, don't hesitate, if possible, to bring it and show it and share it with the judges. Sarah, can you think of any other unique visuals we've used? A lot of times we'll bring in certain pictures of our product. If we have a mock-up or a version of our product that we've already made, we'll bring in visuals that show that or we'll bring in the product itself. Right. And you guys will often try to get the judges to try the product itself, don't you? Just to, to hand it off to them, let them, um, you know, no matter what it is, try it, taste it, see it, something, just to get the, your judges involved and, and work with. Um, girls on your judges' handouts, does that need to be detailed information of everything your team's done or just some general outlines of main points? Usually, um, in FTC, it's a little bit different, but for what you guys would be doing, they're just like main outlines and main points that you want the judges to know about your product or just your project in general. Great, good. Yeah, you can't tell them everything in that presentation, so you want to keep it to the main, most interesting facts that you want to share with the judges. And I liked your, your suggestion of writing down your script, um, again, to help you get it organized. Do you... How do, you, how do you try, do you have just a couple of you on the team write the script? Do you have all of you have input into the script? Um, who decides who says what? Things like that. So how do, how do you girls organize your, your team presentations? Usually we have um, a small group that does the outline for a script. And then as a whole group, we finalize that and decide who says what. And just like funny comments that we want to make. And, but still make sure we get all the points in. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So it's, it's student driven is what the point is. Yes. Yeah, rather than, okay, great. And Sarah, when, when you guys do do a, uh, a script, is it usually uh, done the first time and, and that's finished and you're good to go? No, you go back and improvise after rereading it and finding out how it flows and how comprehensive it is. All right. So, Mr. Phil, can you can you share a little bit of that script? You mean you'd like me to play it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know how it'll come through, but let's have a look. Well, when winter came, they were already having trouble with humidity in the hive. Humidity in the hive causes condensation. If the condensation builds up enough, water droplets will fall onto the clustering bees, causing them to lose their ability to keep the cluster warm. Then a nice, sunny, warm day came about 57 degrees out. I thought it was spring. The drones went out for a cleansing flight, and that night the temperature dropped below 45 degrees, and they all went to the great high blue sky. Here in the studio, we have bee researcher and engineer, McIver. Now, McIver, do you have any solutions to these major problems? Well, some beekeepers use hay bales to insulate their hives, and others rack their hives in insulation and others move their hives to warmer climates 
or indoors. Now, what is wrong with those solutions? Well, hay bales are difficult to keep dry and they attract mice. And insulation doesn't even give you control of your temperature or your condensation. And moving your hives is very risky and it's very expensive. Can't even figure this out with my duct tape and Swiss Army knife. All right, thanks, Phil. So again, you can see from that. Now that presentation was the end of the year Polly's presentation. They had to um, actually do a video of their presentation to submit for the Innovation Award. Uh, so that's why they did it on a green screen and put in those backgrounds and things. But that was the presentation that they gave um, for the judges that year. Uh, again, spruced up a little bit, tweaked a little bit for the, for the competition. But you can see the humor in it, um, the logic. You see the costumes. You know, Emilio was dressed up as a bee. She was the queen bee, Beyonce. Um, MacGyver, you know, had his tools there. So, again, they put a little twist on, on things and had some fun with it. And that's something that the judges will definitely remember you by. So girls, one other thing. What, what does your coach always tell you, to, last thing that they tell you when you're walking into the judging room? Smile. Smile and have fun, right? Yeah, your enthusiasm is what the judges will remember. Your excitement, your enthusiasm, your, your passion for what you're doing um, goes a long ways. So, you know, it's not as important that the kids memorize that script and have it down perfectly as that they go in there with excitement and enthusiasm and they know the project because they did the project and, and let them have fun with it. We still don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, I have one from Ann. She says, do you remember any particularly difficult questions you have received from judges? Good question. Um, I think the hardest questions are always about how the thing is made because sometimes that's really hard to explain or just like the logistics of what you've done and like sequential order is very difficult to explain sometimes. Because sometimes you leave forget details and steps, don't you? So yeah. maybe that would be a good judge's handout even, you know, or a team and maybe a timeline might be a neat thing that the kids could do to show that. So. What's a couple questions, Sarah, the judges always seem to ask you about the presentation? They usually ask how, like, if, for example, if you make a, ver a version of it, like this past year we used an Alexa to make ours, they usually ask how you programmed it or how you constructed it. And a lot of times we even ask, won't they, how, what's some problems that your team overcame to see how the teamwork's coming along? And sometimes that can be difficult because a lot of times we don't have a lot of problems on our teams, do we girls? Uh, sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. So that could be, you know, so um, it's always good to bring in some outside guests. Coaches have heard the presentation over and over and over, but it's always good to bring in parents that haven't heard the presentation or some teachers or other 4-H agents uh, educators that, that haven't heard the presentation and let them, you know, hear it, critique it, give suggestions and ask the team questions. Cause that's probably the hardest thing is to prepare for the questions. Cause you never know what they're going to ask. Do you girls? So. I find a very common question is how did you choose your research project? And typically by the time you get to the end, you might have forgotten how you chose it, what the other options were. So quite often they're looking to find out how you got that initial spark to give you the idea of what you wanted to do. And girls, do, does the team always agree, um, like the first meeting, what you want to do for your service project? Absolutely not. <laughs> There's usually like a good month in the beginning where nobody knows what they want to do and everybody wants to do different things. Um, and how do you decide, Sarah, which service projects you actually narrow it down to and actually do? Narrow it down mostly to what's attainable and what the overall consensus is of what you want to do. A lot of times the team will take it to a vote on which one they think is right, better. Right, right. It's, yeah. it's most doable a lot of times, isn't it? Yeah, so look around in your community, um, you know, like I said, this would be a great year to get out and, and talk to farmers. Um, don't forget to, to stop by equipment dealers. You know, there's a lot of neat, innovative things um, that the equipment dealers probably can share with you. 
so take some tours like that. Talk to some people. Um, like I said, the farmers in the field to the uh, equipment dealers. Uh, you never know. Maybe even your local feed, feed dealers are doing something pretty innovative. Uh, so anything related uh, to agriculture. So we know we've got some, um, uh, you know, specialty crops across the state and different areas, different places, uh, you know, from orchards to uh, some hemp products that are being grown and, and research done on those. So, uh, so and, and the big thing is probably when you go out is have some questions prepared for your folks that you're going out to. Sarah and uh, M. Amelia, can you think of any questions you may ask, you know, when you go to see a farmer that you're, when you're looking for innovative ideas? So I have a question here from Dennis. Um, he says, do judges ever act hostile to test the team's self-confidence? Uh, yes and no. Sometimes judges are a bit more um, intense than others. <laughs> But it's important to remember that you do know what you're talking about. You've done this. You've created this. You know best. So there's no reason to be intimidated by somebody who's being a little bit too intense or might be a little bit touchy about subjects. Um, just be nice about it and explain what you know, because you know what you, you did. And it's a learning project. So you the, encourage the kids to share what they've learned. So Sarah, what do you do when, you're, when your judge says, well, doesn't that solution already exist? Are you allowed to use existing solutions and then build on them? Yeah, you innovate an existing solution. So if it is an existing solution, you figure out how you can improve it and make it better. Awesome. Yep. Good example. Yep. Well, and and that I, is definitely an, a question that usually comes up. So. Well, in our case too, I mean, part of what they could be doing is bringing an existing innovative solution to an area that isn't already using it, you know, so that if, if some kind of agriculture or something like, you know, roof gardens or something is already out there, but perhaps an area doesn't know about it, then that's a perfectly valid, um, you know, sort of um, service project and to bring that information out and proliferate it to people who could benefit from it. Right, right. It's sharing those innovative solutions with others and making them happen. That's what you're, your goal is to do. So, so girls, thank you very much for sharing your years of experience on robotic teams with us tonight. Did an awesome job. Thank and you. we thank everybody for joining us. And again, Phil, if you just want to remind everybody where they can find the previous recordings and the game and the rules and all that good stuff, that'd be great. All right. So this is the um, University of Maryland's 4-H page. And this is, I just basically search for robotics and it always comes to here. Uh, and if this is the robotics page, and it talks about both of the challenges, the um, Forge Engineering Robotics Challenge and the Lego Challenge. And then if you keep on scrolling down, there's a section at the bottom here that has the manual. And then this link is to um, a YouTube playlist that has the constructions, the construction guides for um, the missions. And at the bottom here, we have the, um, these videos um, edited down for time and with any other comments on them. So that's where everything is going to go. At which point I think we are done. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.